So um, I'll introduce myself quickly. I'm Gordon Shepard. I'm a principal at Apollo BBC, and we deal primarily with uh, uh, building performance issues, and, and how we uh, call that is uh, moisture, uh, moisture performance and energy performance of new buildings. We help, we help ensure that when they're being constructed and also existing and historic buildings, we identify ways to improve building performance. Uh, and I'm, I'll talk about what that means. It's, it's a little bit mysterious at this point. Uh, but first, I want to talk about why, uh, why I do what I do. And I, I started out, and Ben and I went to college together and worked at the same concrete lab and uh, had, had similar beginnings. And, and, uh, uh, but <clears throat> I will begin. So learning objectives. Uh, I, I want to talk about moisture mig migration. I want to talk about uh, some evaluation tools. I, I want to talk about a whole building approach, you know, masonry, walls. Uh, they don't live by themselves. They operate in an environment with, you know, often air conditioning or uh, climate control on the inside and moisture on the outside and, and oftentimes a, a moisture drive into a building that, that over, over the life of, of something that is many decades uh, can have serious impacts and I'll get into that as well. Um, and then I'll also talk about some challenges and uh, associated with improving energy performance. Uh, and the reason is, uh, for me, is, um, you know, uh, I believe that, that climate change is happening. If you don't, then energy performance should still be important to you because it saves money. Using less is, is important. Um, and there are, good, there are good ways to do it and bad ways to do it uh, to save energy, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, after Tropical Storm Allison, this is actually the day that I got married, this picture was taken. Um, <laughs> so they say it's lucky if you get rain on your wedding day, so I must be really lucky. Uh, and, and this is a, uh, uh, if you've ever been to Houston, this is Highway 59, and this is a whole uh, sunken expressway underneath it. And there's actually tractor trailers, you know, totally covered and enveloped by water. Uh, you know, climate change is uh, a scary prospect. We don't really know exactly, you know, if it's gonna happen like people suggest or not. Um, you know, the polar bears don't like it. Um, and I'm actually terrified of polar bears, but, uh, you know, if they go extinct, then, you know, it may not be a big deal. Now, the problem with sustainability, and I get really annoyed with it, and I don't even like to use the word, is, is greenwashing. Um, you know, and that's overpromising and saying that they're using their sealant will give you lead points or whatever. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a tough business. You know, it's like I remember when I used to uh, work on my car and, and you know, they, the guy at the muffler shop, he said, yeah, man, this muffler, if you bolt it on your car, it's going to give you 50 horsepower. Well, you know, my car had like, you know, 95 horsepower to begin with. I don't know how it's going to get me 50 more. So there's a lot of greenwashing. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, you know, we can talk about grilling green, for example. So this is how we, in Texas, this is how we, we smoke, uh, smoke the earth, I guess, is what they're doing here. I'm not sure what that's really about. <laughs> but anyway, uh, more, more of this, you know, it sounds like it, it, it sounds good on an advertisement, a lot of this green stuff. But, you know, you have to really dig down into what the performance metrics are and what they're, what they're actually trying to say. Sometimes it's very little. Um, you know, here's the... The thirsty, the, the green Hummer, you know, thirsty for adventure, not gas. Okay, all right. I guess it's all relative compared to the, you know, the, the military spec one. Yeah, it may be true, you know. Um, USGBC, you know, what does green building certification mean? We work on a lot of these LEED certified projects, but what, is, what are you getting for it? You know, um, for me, the most important uh, green attribute would be energy performance and trying to uh, measure that uh, and not, uh, if, if any of you are in practice and you understand energy, that there's a simulation that's done, we'll talk about those quite a bit uh, here in the next few minutes. He hates greenwash, he likes icebergs, you know. Um, and he's gonna keep talking to us. It, I can't get him to stop talking to me during my presentations, so. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of what we're talking about is durability uh, when we're faced with a problem, especially with historic buildings. Um, and that's what a lot of this uh, 
uh, this conference, this workshop is about is durability. Um, but one thing that I found is uh, I'm constantly being challenged uh, to improve energy efficiency while still not compromising durability. And you can see from the, uh, the overlapping, very technical uh, pie chart there, you know, uh, uh, that it, there's only a, a small portion of, of the two that, that come together. You can do things that are, uh, that will improve energy efficiency, certainly, but will greatly adversely affect your uh, durability. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of pure durability work, you know, doing your restoration and uh, taking care of your structure, you know, really doesn't have much of an impact on your energy efficiency. Um, and then we add the, the, you know, the, the, the most important wheel sometimes of affordability. You know, you, you can do something that will help your energy efficiency, but yet the payback on it is 100 years, and so you know, forget about it. Um, but this is more the reality of affordability, is that this is our 2013 budget of affordability. So now we're stuck with this, which is turn your lights off, basically. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll talk a little bit more here. Uh, when I'm faced with a project uh, or, a, or a problem or a question um, on a given project, it, it, my answer to a, to a certain problem uh, often varies, even though the situation seems to be similar, the, the technical problems seem to be similar, and that's because of uh, the owner's needs for the building are often very different. And so when I answer a question or, you know, uh, that it depends, then I'm not, you know, just being cagey or pretending, only pretending that I, you know, have some direction of what to do with the problem. It's just that the owner's uh, requirements uh, often will drive me to a different solution or drive a different solution for it. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, in, in our world, as in the consulting world, it, it is critical for us to document uh, where, we're, where our answers are coming from so that, you know, later on, you know, that everybody knows when somebody else is looking at the same, same question and, and basically uh, double checking you, uh, you know, they can understand, okay, well, that's the basis of this. It, it may not be the, the solution, the ultimate solution, but here, here's, a, here's a reasonable solution based on these, these things. You know, there are other, uh, beyond just durability, there's, you know, funding, what's possible? You know, what are, the, are they, is the owner gonna sell the building in five years? Um, you know, what must be avoided? If we're dealing with a historic building, there are um, a number of things that you probably shouldn't do that might be okay from a durability and energy efficiency and affordability point of view um, that, because it would change the, the character of the building. Um, you know, he, he needs, that's his owner's need, he needs energy efficiency because he wants his icebergs there. Okay, thanks Polar Bear. Um, again, common needs are right in the middle there. Um, they're, they're simple, you know, oftentimes it doesn't have to be a, a, a highly technical uh, thing, but I think if you start with asking, well, what, what is the, what is, where's the, where's the end zone, uh, you really uh, set yourself up for project success. Um, you know, let's not grow mold. Let's not, let's not rot the building out when, you know, when we're mod considering modifying the building or adding insulation or, or changing your roofing type or uh, putting a coating on your brick or, or some sort of, uh, some, some, some sort of other treatment. Um, uh, is it safe? You know, are, are we, uh, do we have structural issues that need to be addressed? Um, is it aesthetically pleasing? I, I have no idea. That's somebody else's call. Um, you know, I'm an engineer, so uh, that make, makes me impaired to make, you know, those kind of subjective calls. Uh, well, what is the expected life cycle? If it's a five-year uh, life cycle, well, that's different. If they're gonna, if they're gonna go in a different direction in five years, well, that's a different thing than if this needs to, to, to be pretty much maintenance free th for the next hundred years. It's gonna be a totally different answer. Um, what are your financial constraints? You want it to last, it's in pretty bad shape now, but you want it to last for a uh, hundred years and be, you know, 20% better energy improvement and yet you don't have any money. All right, okay, well, maybe we need to have a more detailed conversation. Um, uh, Energy performance requirements, you know, that's part of, the, part of the overall conversation and green building requirements. You know, some, you know, a lot of people find some value in having green building, uh, some certification for uh, PR purposes for, so that they can do their own greenwashing in their advertising. 
Um, I'm being a little silly here, but, uh, but we need to respond to those needs. Uh, having a document that clarifies where your approach is coming from is important. You know, making sure that your structure is taken care of. Um, you know, evaluating the building from a, a whole building performance, you know, or even if you're just looking at a, at a, at a focus problem, say a, a, a masonry wall that, that has some cracks or, you know, is, is, is having some leaking issue or, you know, you've got some efflorescence on one side and you're trying to figure out what to do about it. Um, you know, and then if you're going to do something, predict what it's going to do. Um, you know, oftentimes we're making decisions that are based off of uh, some white paper that somebody wrote that is in a climate that uh, may not be applicable. You know, what works in Boston may not work here. Oftentimes it doesn't. And, uh, uh, and then measurement, measurable performance criteria I think is important, particularly when we're talking about um, you know, strength considerations, when we're talking about energy considerations, you know, uh, we, can, we can look at something and scratch at it with our fingernail, we can, get it, we can get a lot of information that way, but, you know, measurement and testing, I think, is, is important to be able to understand what we're doing. Um, verify energy performance, and then, you know, the, another response could be, hey, we need to get a certification. All right, great. You know, that could be useful. Now let's get into maybe more what you guys are looking for, but I can't start without understanding where a project is coming from, but talking about the building's condition. Uh, and uh, again, evaluating it from a, a whole building approach I think is very useful um, because it, sometimes it gives you a different set of eyes um, than, than what you were uh, originally looking at a problem with. I'm, I'm a structural engineer by training, but I've had the, uh, the great displeasure of working mostly with a lot of mechanical engineers over the last 10 years or so. And, uh, and I look at things differently, you know. When, when you're a hammer, everything is a nail. So, you know, if you're working with other people, you begin to see things differently. Um, <clears throat> so we want to understand the building a little better, you know, include, including usage and history. Um, I want to talk about the impact of mechanical air conditioning on masonry buildings. That, that's, that's actually hurricane damage, but it's not, it's not air conditioning. But, but I will talk about what, <laughs> what air conditioning does here in a second. Uh, it, 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 it can be a, a big problem. So we've got uh, building pressurization, you know, either positive or negative. If your building is sucking, if it's exhausting more air than it's supplying, you're going to be sucking air, and typically here it's going to be warm, moist, hot, humid air into your building. So you're going to be driving a whole lot of moisture into your building, and that's going to be doing things to finishes, to materials, to assemblies and components that you may not um, really understand. You know, unplanned air flows. These, um, these uh, mechanical systems move air in all kinds of different ways. They, 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 and oftentimes they'll suck air into walls and spaces that are not perimeter uh, in ways that you didn't really understand and uh, until you open up the wall and you realize that it's growing mold in there and you don't really know why. Um, oftentimes, you know, because these air moving devices are, are not perfectly sealed, you're going to have unplanned air flows. Temperature and humidity control. Um, one of the things when we're looking at uh, exterior wall performance and predicting performance when we're uh, changing some uh, uh, piece or some layer in our wall assembly. Uh, one of the most important uh, aspects is how well are we controlling humidity uh, in there? You know, I'm, I'm in Houston. It's nice and humid there too. Um, and I think you guys understand that, you know, that humidity control is a, is a huge issue. Some places don't control it well and then occupants make it worse. Um, you know, if we're not controlling humidity in a space at 72 degrees, it's going to feel still kind of warm. And then you crank it down to 68 degrees because you're not feeling comfortable, and that increases the moisture drive that, that exacerbates any other problems that you have. Um, condensation, it increases the risk for condensation if you have poor humidity control. You know, uh, condensation is a, is a function of air qualities, of moisture in the air and temperature in the air, and surface temperatures. So you can see how uh, masonry and uninsulated masonry uh, can, uh, in, in, in conjunction with poor humidity control, can result in condensation problems. Uh, vapor drive. 
You know, we're constantly, your air conditioning systems are constantly drying out your air. It's generally more warm and moist on the outside of your building, therefore moisture is constantly pulling through the walls. Great. Building pressurization, we talked about it a little bit. You've got mechanical systems, you've got stack, you've got wind that's, you know, you want to know exactly what the building pressurization is, but you can't really keep the wind steady, so it's going to be constantly uh, varying from what you think it should be. Um, this is a video that is not working, but what it shows is, you know, a hole in a wall that I didn't make, but I've got a smoke bottle here, and just as the wind, this is actually on uh, South Padre Island at, at the, uh, at one of the buildings there, that as the wind, and there's always wind, is, is going over the parapets, it, you know, you could see a, a, when I had a steady stream of smoke coming out of the, the bottle, that every gust of wind would just act like a venturi, and, and even 20 feet lower on this wall, it would just pull the smoke into the wall. And sure enough, you know, below every window, and you know, at a bunch of places around the wall, there were signs of, of moisture damage from, from condensation related to that. Um, We've talked about this quite a bit, uh, unplanned air flows, but we'll talk about what it means here. You know, this is a typical cavity wall, and oftentimes we've got a parapet, and we've got warm, moist air coming in, and then we've got uh, cool air down here, cool and moist, and you know, when you've got your, your, uh, your warm front and your cool front, in your, in your ceiling space, you're gonna get thunderstorms. I'm kidding. But what you're going to get are, is, is a higher risk of condensation as your warm, as your warm humid air comes in and, and hits these cold surfaces. And so oftentimes things that appear as roof leaks or as wall leaks are, uh, are actually condensation because of uh, unplanned airflow. Um, it makes it worse is that oftentimes in a commercial office building or co commercial type space where we've got a drop ceiling, and we've got a, your return air plenum up above the ceiling here. This is all being pulled in a vacuum to pull it back to your air handler. So that's sucking more and more air out of the, uh, out of the through these, this unsealed parapet and into your building. So that makes it even worse. And this is Denver in honor of Mike Schuler, And you get the same problem, except for there you actually get lightning in your ceiling space. But, but it's the same thing. You end up with cold air meeting with your warm and humid air down in your, uh, in your thing, and you still get uh, the risk of uh, condensation at different areas. Usually it's right where that floor plate and the, at, the, at the bottom of the parapet is. So humidity control, talk a little bit more about that. Um, I sweat a lot, so uh, you know, humidity control is important to me. Uh, but when we're talking about walls, and we're talking about uh, building performance. We don't really, we, we, people measure, well, it's, you know, it's about 50% humidity here in the middle of the room. Well, that doesn't really matter. I mean, it matters a little bit, but what's most important is what's happening at the wall. Um, at that location, it can vary quite a bit. Because, um, so we can talk about uh, vapor, vapor barriers and vapor retarders, and there's a lot of confusion about it. Um, but it, it's actually relatively simple. So basically we get condensation when uh, our, uh, our vapor pressure, which is the amount of moisture that's in your, in your air, reaches the saturation pressure. That means your air is saturated and water starts falling out of the air. It happens every day when it rains. So um, this would be our normal condition, but I'm in this house and I'm sweaty because I've been outside and I'm wearing a jacket you know, in the springtime when I shouldn't be. Um, and, and so, and I'm cooking, I've got a, you know, a pot of rice going and I've got, I just took a shower and I'm doing laundry and now it's humid. So um, what happens is we are, that humidity reaches the vapor pressure, uh, reaches, reaches saturation pressure and then we start getting humidity on the walls. I, have any of you seen a, this sort of condition uh, on your walls? You know, particularly your bathroom walls and, and things like that as you're taking a shower. It just happens all the time. You know, but when we're talking about moisture driving in from the outside, you know, one way to reduce that is to, you know, one, one strategy that's used often is to uh, introduce some sort of vapor retarder. And what that does is it reduces the, uh, 
the, the flow of moisture from the outside, or from this direction, from the high direction to the low direction, and uh, to a way that it doesn't cause condensation. So, you know, how many of you know who this is? <laughs> I'm impressed some of you, you younger people uh, know who it is. It's Dr. McCoy from Star Trek, and he's the doctor, and he's, uh, uh, the reason he's here is because he's very uh, practical. You know, he doesn't have, any, doesn't have any patience for anything that doesn't really cut to the teeth of the matter and get something done. You know, Mr. Mr. Spock, who's the science officer in their, star, in their spaceship, he, you know, he's always talking about his, his, the logic and, and the science of it, and, and he has no patience for, for Mr. Spock. Uh, so what does this have to do with real life? Okay, so I'll give you a real life example of, of how mechanical systems are impacting it. This is in Galveston. This is a, a 1870s uh, department store that was being renovated into condominium space, which seems to be the trend of things. Um, and what happened is, you see those nice new ceiling joists up there, and uh, Ben was talking about how those were uh, put into pockets in the wall. Well, they aren't anymore, but when they, they, they raised the ceiling up a couple feet, uh, by removing the joists, and they wanted to create more of a premium feel for the top level ones. And uh, here I'm looking at it. And it's, uh, but what we found is at the corner we've got huge cracks. One that once that dead load of the roof was taken off, these things that were you know probably hairline cracks and nobody really even noticed before really opened it up, and this whole corner of the building basically started tilting out. If you've been to Galveston, it's right over the Strand, um, and this was you know basically the week before Dickens on the Strand was about to start, so it was about to be packed full of people. Um, it was a real problem, um, and the reason, well, one reason that it was happening was is when we when they pulled off the interior beaded board uh, uh, finish on the inside, what they saw was a huge amount of, of salt staining, of, of, of efflorescence on the inside of the walls. And you could take your finger and you could wallow out the, uh, the mortar to the point where you could actually pull individual bricks out. So, I mean, it was, it was in pretty tough shape. And this is a triple, triple width wall. Um, and, but, but the reason it had done, it had been retrofitted in about the 1930s with air conditioning. And so all of this time, hidden behind that, that wood finish, they had uh, moisture migrating through the, uh, the, uh, uh, the wall from the outside to the inside, and then evaporating you know, after, after it got to the surface of the wall and, and uh, leaving it salt and basically taking all the good cementitious stuff out of your mortar and depositing it on the inside face where it wasn't really doing anything to hold your brick together at that point. Um, so, we had a, a pretty weak spot there, uh, and the, the, what we did, we had to move pretty quickly. I think we issued this drawing, which isn't the, most pretty, the prettiest thing, but uh, this is a self-tensioning net that uh, we, we basically knew that there was no scaffolding that was going to uh, hold up you know, this 4,000-pound chunk of brick, so we wanted to hold it to the wall. Um, and so we, the self-tensioning net is really cool. Uh, it, it looks like fishnet pantyhose, and you basically loose lay it on the wall, and we clipped it into the wall using some anchors and some carabiners, and then you spray it down with water, and you can just see these strands starting to twist, and it, and it uh, really tightens up around it. It was really cool, uh, but then the masons were able to come in from the inside and, and, uh, and take, out the, take out the whole section of of bad brick and uh, or of cracked section and, and retooth in new new masonry and and they also did some other work at the uh, the mortar joints for it. Um, other common ev evaluation tools uh, that that we deal with are uh, air leakage testing, infrared thermography, moisture meters, uh, hygrometers, and data loggers. And we'll talk about each one of those here in just a minute. Uh, no, it, this is really a slow, long-term deal. What they had is they had, it was a triple width masonry with stucco on the outside, and then they had a stucco uh, finish coat on it, and it was painted. And so that had some vapor resistance, but over the course of, you know, 90 years, it, it had, uh, you know, it basically just needed to be redone. It needed to be uh, uh, repointed and have a lot more uh, uh, 
more of the good stuff put in there. Does that make sense? You know, I mean, you're going to have that, that, that vapor drive throughout it. I think you need to be aware of it. And, you know, there's nothing that, nothing that we can do is going to last forever. I think you just need to understand that it's going to be a, a long-term deterioration mechanism because of the moisture driving from, from the inside to the outside. You know, on the, uh, up in Boston or something or in, in uh, Ireland, you know, a lot of times they have those sacrificial lime coats that they put on the outside of the, of the walls. You know, and that's, you know, in the... Uh, uh, you know, uh, because it's usually warmer and moister on the inside, you've got that moisture drive going to the out, outside of the wall. And so that'll, th those things will pop off and they'll, they'll put on a new coat of it. Is that building located in Galveston? Yes, yes, sir. Where you find the uh, it's on, in the Strand area, on the, on the harbor side section of it. So it was 1870, so it was actually one that made it through the big hurricane there in 1904. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. You got that right. Um, so we'll go through it. I'll talk about air, air tightness. It's important to me, um, especially in hot, humid climates, but everywhere, too. Um, uh, the benefits of air tightness reduces outside air infiltration. It'll reduce your energy consumption. It'll reduce moisture entering your building in hot, humid climates. If you're in Denver and it's, and it's uh, zero degrees and it's... Uh, your air outside is bone dry. Oftentimes those air leakage are the only thing keeping your building from, from rotting because you've got uh, so much other stuff going on. So that actually acts as a drying mechanism in cold weather. Uh, it'll Im improve your humidity control a lot in hot, humid climates. You know, because we're air conditioning screen porches, you know, in essence, because our buildings are so air, air leaky, you know, we, our mechanical systems have a hard time controlling humidity and, and taking that moisture out of there. Uh, improving thermal comfort and then reducing bulk water leakage. And that's sort of an indirect thing. Usually when we, the air comes in through holes, when you seal up the holes, then you end up with less water leakage. It's a nice byproduct. Um, so what's so bad? This is the, the other way of saying it. You know, reduced energy efficiency, mold, air quality problems, especially in hot humid climates, uh, wet insulation, Mechanical system's not working as intended. You're not getting the efficiency you want. You're not getting the, the temperature control. Um, let's talk about building breathing for a second. I hear this a lot, um, and, it, and it drives me crazy. It's my, this is my one, of, well, one of only a few soapboxes that I'll get on in the next few minutes. Um, so buildings don't breathe. It's a mis misused anthropomorphism. Uh, you know, they don't have lungs. But, but the reason it, 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 it's, it's a problem is because when I ask somebody, well, what do you mean by that? You know, it's unclear whether they're talking about air leakage or vapor diffusion. So even if, say, you know, we, we talked a little bit about vapor, you know, say there's no air moving from inside this lecture hall or from outside this lecture hall to inside this lecture hall. So there's no, there's no air movement. Um, but since it's warmer and moister outside, there will be a moisture gradient, and moisture will be slowly diffusing through the walls. A very small amount, actually. But when we have holes and we have mechanical systems moving, then we're drawing in a whole lot of air through little holes and cracks. There's always holes and cracks and things. So that's a difference. Um, you know, when somebody says, no, 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 don't do that. My building needs to breathe. I don't know what they're talking about. And so I, I, want, I try to get more specific than that. So it, it's confusing, and um, uh, I'd like to avoid it. Um, air leakage guidelines, I'll, I'll keep this quick because I know uh, Ben wants to, to go again uh, before lunch and, and then we're going to have lunch and lunch is very important to everybody. Um, ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers, they have a guideline and don't worry about the units so much, but um, they say, well, 0.1 to 0.6 of cubic feet per minute. 75 pascals. So that's, that's a relative uh, guideline of, of how airtight your building should be, with 0.1 being very airtight and 0.6 being eh, kind of like that. But what, if you don't really have a, a coherent air tightness strategy, you're going to be around really around 1.0. Um, but you know, we've seen, if you're actually thinking about it, you can, you can be you know, uh, four times better than that if you're, if you're trying pretty hard. 
and that's by using sealants, by using weather stripping, by using uh, spray foam and, and things like that, ways to get, you know, this, this weatherization that we're talking about is really an air sealing for the most part initiative. Uh, here's the, our big uh, commercial air leakage testing equipment in use there. Uh, this is uh, at Rice University. We're testing one of their buildings there. Um, again, more numbers. Uh, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers has actually led this. That they're actually requiring that all of their buildings be tested and be very airtight because of the benefits that we talked about already. Uh, moving from 0.25, which I think is pretty decent, to 0.1, so they're pushing it even further. Um, and then Washington State also has some requirements in place for airtightness. It's very, it's very humid there as well. Um, can it be too tight? And this is, a, this is a, a little bit of a tricky answer, but the short answer is no. Uh, the problems with excessive air tightness are ventilation issues. And we'll I'll talk about what those problems of excessive air tightness are. And um, uh, at what tightness do you require ventilation? And usually it, it'll depend, but usually that'll be something like 0.15. You know, most, say most of our, our houses, for example, and uh, are not, you know, uh, mechanically ventilated. You know, they just sort of, they get air sucked in however it happens to come in, through the walls, through the, through the roofs. When we turn on the exhaust fan in the bathroom or in the kitchen, you know, it just kind of sucks air in. Um, so, and that's, a, and, and so at a pretty tight level that you're unlikely to achieve through normal means, you're gonna require ventilation. So you're probably not going to get these air tightness problems that I'm about to talk to you about in normal practice. But if you go, if you're really good and you're very thorough, you might. Um, you know, indoor air quality issues, moisture accumulation in cold weather because of that lack of drying from that bone cold air going through it, not as much of a problem here. But you could have a problem with a combustion app appliance that's just drawing air. You can starve out chimneys and, and exhausts and things if your building is too airtight. Um, if, you, if you have a very airtight house, for example, and you try to light a fire and you don't have some sort of way to, to have makeup air because that's gonna, that chimney is going to uh, uh, be pulling a lot of air out of your building, you, know, that, that, that can, you can end up smoke backing up into your, into your building. And door and window operation, we've seen some buildings that are very, very airtight that, um, you know, and they're slightly positively pressurized that it is a, it is a real uh, uh, bear to close the, the main entry doors or, you know, various openings into the, into the building because of, you know, that you're fighting that current of air. And that's often true when you've got stack problems too, but that's different. Um, testing equipment uh, is a, uh, you know, a, a door fan uh, that's calibrated to, to measure how much air is passing through it, pressure gauge where you're measuring the amount of air that's going through at that, at that pressure. And then, you know, if we're doing a really big building that, um, it's not just for houses, we're doing really big commercial buildings, um, you know, we'll have a computerized setup that's, that's taking measurements. And, uh, and, and you know, from, from just those numbers that we were talking about, we can get, you know, the amount of square feet of hole area that you have in your building, that, and that helps when you try to seal things up. Um, again, we can assist mechanical engineers to design their systems right. They're assuming a number, and it's not really based on anything except for, you know, whatever came out of the air. Um, it came out of their book and what they've used before. But if we're giving them real-time data, they can make a better decision and, and make, make better design. We can quantify the size of the holes uh, of the, the combined all of your holes in your building so that you can uh, uh, tighten those things up. And you know after you've sealed that electrical conduit going through your wall, you know you've got about you know, a quarter square foot there, so you're that much closer to your goal. Um, some limitations there, it's difficult applying these standards to historic buildings. Um, you know, that's a, a, a common problem with it. You know, so what? I'm at 0.5. So what does that mean? Well, it means you're at 0.5. You know, so it's a, it, it does have some difficulty. And, and then, but if we're incorporating that data back into our energy model, then we can, we can really understand it better. Um, supplemental tools, we use smoke. I showed you the, the smoke tube earlier. Um, touch, you can actually feel it. You can feel the air moving when you've got your building pressurized and sometimes just on a windy day, so it's always windy here, um, you know, you can feel air moving 
you know, drafts coming through your walls. And then infrared, here you can see uh, some cold air coming in through the building. Uh, infrared, these are pretty pictures. They're not great technical, technical pictures, but they are, but they are pretty uh, of <clears throat> some buildings in Austin. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the applications, I won't spend a lot of time on applications, but they use uh, uh, a lot in the military. Um, and, you know, this is, this is really, it had to have been, uh, this application had to have been invented by a woman. Um, or because uh, uh, what they're doing is, is, since they're sensing temperature, you know, that the, uh, uh, what they're doing is they're finding, they're able to see troops on the ground and people hidden behind obstacles that you can't see your nighttime work. And so they're finding the, uh, the hottest guys and taking them out. So maybe, <laughs> so that's, that's what they're doing there. Sorry, that wasn't, that was bad. Uh, we'll get more technical here in a second. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is ocean current mapping. You know, the, the oceans have very different uh, temperatures. Uh, it makes some pretty awesome images for it. Um, uh, medical, uh, very useful. You know, people ask me, well, isn't that that x-ray thing? Well, it's not really x-ray. It's just we're just measuring temperature. Um, you know, here you can see swelling in a horse hoof there. Um, but, uh, and we can use it for buildings, too. Um, we use infrared for roof assessments, for energy loss analysis, for air leakage testing, for um, moisture surveys, to, and for uh, verifying uh, insulation, insulation, the installation of insulation, uh, or lack thereof, and then you know, for pipings and district service, if we've got hot, hot and cold water piping, uh, we can do that too. And, uh, and also electrical circuits, we can find hot circuits that might have uh, short to ground issues or things like that. Um, you know, here's a, here's a masonry, uh, masonry uh, CMU building, and you can see that the pilasters are showing hot uh, compared to the rest of the building. And it looks like we've got something happening here at the, uh, uh, <laughs> at the, control, or the, uh, uh, the control joint there. Uh, so something's happening there. And then what it does is it gives you a visual uh, indication that something's going on there, and the, the next step is to really go in and hands-on and, and actually look and see what's happening, uh, understanding what was supposed to be there. So you may or may not have a problem, but it, it's a good place to start to, to give you a visual indicator of something different going on at that location. Um, here we can see which, which people are using their air conditioner at a given moment. Um, so it's kind of like a spy cam in, in, in this one. Um, the, the building engineer spy cam. <laughs> Sounds really terrible. Um, this is a skylight that we're using. Uh, here you can see air leakage at an eave. Uh, you can see the warm air coming out into the cool night. Um, here we have uh, uh, basically a, a, a roof uh, parapet coping at a head wall. And you can see that, that warm air is leaking out of that into the cold night. Um, and in here we have uh, uh, an exhaust fan or uh, uh, some sort of mechanical equipment there where we're leaking warm air out of the building there. Here's some standards. I can give these to you if you are interested. I'll be happy to give those to you later. Um, uh, limitations. It doesn't really measure leaks you know, you're getting surface temperature, it's affected by the reflectivity of the material. Or uh, uh, if it's a very shiny, reflective surface, it's going to oftentimes have trouble uh, getting uh, a good, reasonable measurement off of it. Um, uh, things like metal uh, or glass are going to have a hard time getting a good measurement off of them. Um, uh, Incident angle, especially when you're the more uh, reflective the surface is, the, the incident angle is the angle at which you're, you're pointing your, your infrared camera at. If it's, you're pointing it at a surface that's got a rake to it, you know, you're going to have a hard time getting a measurement, and it gets worse the more reflective the surface is. So problems. You know, trying to give you the straight dope here. It's not, there's no silver bullet. Um, that's why we have to use a number of tools. Uh, moisture meters. This is simple stuff, uh, but very useful. Uh, there are uh, pin type resistance and non-invasive meters, and there are other types too, but I'll talk about these here in a second. 
uh, resistance meter. You know, you've got basically two electrical probes and you're measuring the resistance between the, the tips of it. And normally when something gets wetter, it, it decreases the electrical resistance between the tips. And so you, you get a higher reading. And so uh, that's, that's the basis for, for this type of meter. Um, very useful. Uh, they are uh, uh, usually expressed as uh, uh, percent moisture content in wood. And what they say is that above 20% is in the, the red zone. So uh, uh, red is apparently bad and it, it's more subject to uh, decay mechanisms at, at higher moisture contents. Uh, but it, when you're using it for other materials, uh, it's based on the concept that the materials will have the same uh, equilibrium relative humidity even, that means they, they'll, in, in a given relative humidity, say it's 80% relative humidity, that they're going to uh, uh, come to equilibrium uh, based on that ambient humidity. And even if, you know, the wood has less moisture than the masonry at that given, given uh, relative humidity. So that's, that's the basis of it. So that's, you, the, the, when you're using something that is a relative indicator like this, I think it's a nice starting point. Um, but it, it, it definitely needs, you need to uh, verify with, uh, you know, basically your hands on it and, and better understand what's going on. Uh, so it's a good start and it can help you identify changes within, a, a, you know, a field of materials. Um, limitation, you know, it doesn't directly measure moisture content, it's measuring electrical resistivity. So if you get a nail there, <laughs> do you think your, uh, your resistivity is going to go up or down? You know, I mean, I think you're going to get uh, less resistivity there. Um, salts can affect it. Salts are electrolytes. So uh, carbonaceous materials, uh, more electrolytes. Um, it's affected by the pressure. You get two different guys or, or girls or people doing it, you're going to get different results. You know, uh, if you push it really hard, it's going to give you a different result if you push it lightly. So it leads to consistency questions. Um, uh, GE Protimeter, they, uh, they have a quote in there, uh, in their manual. One of their manuals is actually a UK manual. I'm not sure it would make it past their, uh, uh, the, the attorneys here. Uh, but they say it would be foolish to carry out a survey without a moisture meter, but it would be no less foolish to rely on a moisture meter on its own for a complete diagnosis. And I think that says a lot. It's a very useful tool. You need to, you need to back it up with, with other uh, things. And don't use it on polar bears. Uh, that's personal experience there. <laughs> Advantages, simple, fast, cheap, great for relative studies. You can cover a whole lot of ground very fast. And, uh, uh, and this last one is, is sort of my own uh, addition there. You know, qualitative measurement, you know, if you're pushing in and your probes sink into the wood, I think, you know, you, you're you're dealing with, uh, you've got some decay mechanism going on there that you need to investigate. So I found that, I found that out too. Hey, I'm going to take the moisture content. Oh, it's dry. <laughs> What's holding the wall up? Well, maybe it's the masonry. I don't know. So we'll see. Um, Non-invasive meters. Uh, we try to get the same, same uh, concept here. It's based on uh, uh, conduct, conduction and capacitance. Uh, and what you're doing is you're looking below the surface, about a half an inch or so, uh, but you should really back it up with a pin meter and, and, and other, uh, other methods. Um, the limitations are similar. It's slightly different. It doesn't measure uh, moisture directly, and it's uh, somewhat less accurate than a resistance meter. And again, you get great, get great coverage rates with one of these capacitance meters. You can just run it across the wall until you find the wet spot. Um, and that's, that's pretty useful. Um, and I don't know what happened to my, uh, my font size here. Um, but so when I'm in practice, uh, I always ask, you know, if I'm going to be poking something that I've got permission to leave little marks, even though they're relatively small, uh, check the calibration prior to use try to find the benchmark, and that's not this benchmark that presented earlier. This is, you know, you want to find something that's going to be a control or, or, or uh, a dry surface that you understand what you're dealing with. Uh, you know, and then I try to use a sketch um, where I'm locating 
uh, important features of the building, things like downspouts, drains, plumbing lines. Sometimes that can be a little bit challenging. You have to guess a little bit between where fixtures are and where the clean out is and make some, I mean, you've got to make some assumptions there. Uh, use an even pin force. So if you're passing the meter around, you might, you might uh, have a problem. If you find a damp zone, you know, you should follow up in the vicinity to develop a map of the issue. So basically take a whole bunch of points around that area to do it. Uh, and then you note any other visible manifestations of changes in that area. You know, and we'll call those symptoms. Maybe it's a discoloration. Maybe it's um, something else. You know, maybe you're getting some salt staining. Maybe you're getting some cracking or separations in your wood or, or something else is going on there. Um, you know, and then you can test over multiple days to see if it's changing, if it's based off of a rain or if it's not. If you've got, you know, if it's only on the hot days next to where your air conditioning condensate leak, or your condensate drain is, oh, okay, well, try to get some correlations there. And that's a good use for it. Hygrometers, um, remember we talked about humidity control, it's important to me. Um, we use it to measure relative humidity and air temperature. And uh, some have surface temperature sensors where you can measure the dew point. So you can measure your, your, uh, your interior humidity and then you can point your gun at the, at the surface and measure the dew point there. So that's, uh, and it can tell you if, if you're going, if you're at risk for condensation based on the interior temperatures and surface temperatures. Um, similar to that, we've got data loggers in the office and we use this a lot uh, to try to understand what's really happening. This is a uh, temperature and Ours, or you can get some other features on it, but we've got temperature and relative humidity meters that are battery powered, and you just sometimes you put them, build them into a wall cavity sometimes, and leave them there, and you can get the data out of them remotely, or you can put them in an attic, or put them in different places in a, in a stud cavity. You can put it adjacent to different things, and, and, and you can track relative humidity and temperature over time. And that way you can get an idea of, of what's going on, especially when you correlate it to the exterior weather and the interior usage of, of the building. Uh, and that can be, give you some great information uh, for a localized problem that, that may be going on. Analysis, now that we've got the condition of the building all sorted out, we're gonna talk a little bit about analysis and, and performance prediction. Um, you know, when we're analyzing, we need to ask what's important. Uh, what's possible, and what are the trade-offs, and, and, and um, a lot of that will go back to that initial discussion that we had with the, with the owner of, uh, you know, what are your needs for the building, what's going on here, and then all of your analysis is really uh, viewed through that lens. Um, you know, are we making our decisions based on fear, because we saw, you know, the, uh, the, the white paper on isonine saying that it, it rots out your building, or are we doing it based on science and a predictive mindset? Uh, so we need to, we need to predict things um, and, uh, and try to understand what's happening. Um, we use a couple different ones, but two I want to talk about today are uh, uh, moisture uh, modeling, uh, woofy, and, I'll, and we'll predict the impact of retrofits on moisture performance and energy modeling. Uh, we'll predict the, the energy benefits of, 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 uh, of changes. And I think that, you know, having both of those, you know, that's the energy modeling is the, on that energy performance side of the circles that I showed earlier. And then uh, the uh, moisture modeling uh, is on the durability. And so if we get something that works for both of those, then we know we're in that happy sweet spot of being in between there and uh, not sacrificing building durability for energy efficiency. Now whether it's affordable or not is a whole different uh, ball, ball of wax. But, uh, so predictive analysis, one size fit doesn't fit all. Um, everyone looks for a prescriptive method, meaning on every case we use our studs on 16 inch centers and fill it with our 19 bats. Or, you know, that's a predictive, uh, uh, a prescriptive solution. It means it's one size fits all. Um, uh, a more engineered and accurate way is to predict the outcome. Uh, but understand that it's chicken salad. Or you can't make chicken salad out of chicken feathers, or worse. Um, and we're gonna talk about that in energy modeling here, just for a second. Uh, it's highly dependent on your assumptions. 
uh, your walls, thermal and solar properties, your mechanical soft assumptions, software, and inputs. Um, we deal with a lot of lead projects, a lot of green building projects, and, and we see these energy models come out of them, and you have to simulate the energy performance of your building, uh, where you know, you're getting these great energy performance of the building, you know, 30, 40 percent below energy code, and it's amazing. But then when they actually, uh, you know, go to the building, they're like, what, what happened? You know, we're, we're using energy code levels at best, and we're getting no improvement. Well, what happened? Well, you know, you can, like any software, you know, structural software, if you, you can, you know how it works, you know the, the twists and turns, you can goose it. And, and make it look great for the, uh, for the energy model, and it's not gonna perform like that. So, you know, it's chicken salad. Let's talk about heat gain, which is the most important uh, mode of, uh, of energy use here is cooling. It's a predominant way of doing it. And, and this is rough numbers, but it's about 25% conductive here and 75% radiant. What does that mean? That means 20, only a quarter of your heat gain in, your, in the summertime is because of the temperature difference between the inside and the outside. It's only, what, 15 degrees maybe? Say you're 75 inside and it's 90 outside, it's only 15 degrees. And then the rest of it is from the sun. The sun coming down, hitting your windows, heating up surfaces, he, you know, uh, hitting your roof. Um, so when we're talking about energy efficiency and modifications, you know, increased insulation is on the small side of the pie, and since we're approaching lunch, I like to focus on the large side of the pie. <laughs> I want to take my chunks out of that. If I'm going to spend a dollar and I'm going to reduce my conductive heat gain by 10%, uh, you know, that's going to give us 2.5% uh, of our total energy uh, heat gain versus if we can reduce this, but with a dollar and, and save 7.5%, you know, uh, we're going we're gonna to get much better return on our dollar here. So let's focus on the big side of the pie. Increased insulation is on the small side of the pie when you're talking about heat gain. Changing out your windows for, to, to double insulated glass or triple insulated glass makes sense in, in very cold climates when we've got a large temperature difference and the conductive proportion of your heat loss is, is, is much higher. Double glazing is on the small side of the pie. I don't like the small side of the pie. Uh, orientation, if you're dealing with an existing building, you're stuck, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> shading, um, you know, trees are wonderful. If you stop that sunlight before it hits your building, that's dollars in your pocket. Um, if you can convince somebody to build a high rise right in front of your building, that's a good way to shade your building. Uh, reflective roofing, that's a good way to do it. Um, you know, the old, this is an old, 20s building, I think, in uh, Fort Stockton, you know, and they've got the eaves, and this is just at the end of the day when the sun is just barely low enough to start peeking through the windows, but for most of the day, they get absolutely no direct sun, and so, you know, replacing that with double glazing for the hot summer isn't going to make a huge impact. Um, you know, air tightness is important. If you're getting hot air leaking in, that's important. Um, so I'll talk about wall modeling now. And this is the predicting for moisture accumulation in, in, your, in your walls. Uh, again, wall modeling is chicken salad. We know what that means. If you start with bad stuff, you start with chicken feathers, you're not gonna get, uh, it's a, you're not gonna get a good result. Um, it calculates heat and moisture transfer through, through assemblies, and I'll show you how we do it in just a second. You need accurate material and property data, and uh, you can test various retrofit options for relative risks. You know, mass walls can tolerate a good deal of water. Insulation does not. Um, will moisture accumulate? Will it cause problems? Will it come to the inside? That's what we want to know. What happens when the walls get wet? What happens when you add insulation? I don't know. It depends. So here's the City of Houston permitting setter that we had the delight of working on. Um, it's a very cool place. Uh, here, this is one of the grand opening deals. Um, they've got a, a vegetated roof there with a water trough, and uh, you know they left a lot of the structure exposed. And you can see the uh, 
the walls are, uh, are the, uh, the masonry. Um, they've, got a, they've got the uh, Green Building Resource Center right there for it, and uh, you know, underfloor air conditioning. It, it wanted to be a demonstration project for what could be done, and that was how the city of Houston was, was trying really hard to be progressive there. And here you can see the wall, and it is a wall. There is no insulation. Uh, you can see how the, the, the windows are, they were replaced, um, but you can see that how they were uh, mounted into the wall. It's just a flush mount kind of thing. Um, but it looks out over the, uh, the, that vegetated roof. Um, I think 5% of the city's construction budget has to go towards art. So, uh, so here you can see some of the artwork that we're getting there. Um, this is, a, I think this is like my last car that I had. Uh, <laughs> that is now art, artwork. I didn't get that 5% though. Um, but in order to get there, the developer, they approached the project team and we were part of the project team. Uh, they said, you know what? We don't want those mace, exposed masonry walls on the inside. We want to fur them out and put insulation and insulate them. And we're like, okay, well, before you do that, let's make sure that we're not going to cause a problem. You know, they, they were, they were, the energy code was pushing them, you know, we go, oh, let's say, you know, extensive renovation, we've got to meet energy code, and the walls don't meet energy code. Okay, well, let's make sure that we're not causing a problem and that uh, we're not going to accumulate. This is, this is, you know, we've got lots of cool inputs on our software. Again, it's chicken salad, so you have to be very careful, and uh, you, you try to choose you know, you can choose your orientation. You can you do a, an inclined wall if you want. You, know, you can check what uh, height of the building that you can use. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, and then here is our wall. This is the outside. This is the inside of the building. And you can see we've got three widths of brick across it. It's visual. And then we've got insulation. We've got three and a half inches of insulation and then gyp. Uh, drywall on the inside and so we ran the model which is it has Houston climate data in there to see what would happen to our lovely permitting center and and this is our temperature and relative humidity prediction that we did but what we got was the dreaded fang well I'll tell you what that means um, you see these two gray lines right there and I'll use the laser pointer actually instead of stomping around uh, the, uh, this gray line here, and this dotted one too, but this gray line, anything that is above here, this is relative humidity, so this is high humidity up top, this is low humidity, and this is low temperature, and this is high temperature. So anything up here is in the temperature and humidity region that likes to grow mold, okay? And anything down here is happy and pretty dry. Okay, and so you can see that mold likes to grow, it can grow down to, you know, almost uh, 30 degrees if it's humid enough, but it really likes it above 60 degrees. So, and we're spending a lot of our time, these are each, this is composed of different data points, each one of these are dots, and the darker it gets, the more dots we got during our three year modeling window. And so we got a lot of dots in the moldy area, and that's why it looked like that, the, the horrible fang there. Um, we didn't like it. We thought we had the risk of uh, accumulating moisture in the walls, so we modeled it without, the way it's been for the last 70 years. And we got the ring. Now what I like about this is that it started here, the model started here, and that was based off of the initial moisture contents that we assumed for the materials, and then it just basically got to this, uh, you know, uh, stable moisture content without ever approaching this. And so um, that's what they ended up going with and uh, they ended up having those nice exposed masonry even though it, it uh, went against the, the energy code uh, for the City of Houston code enforcement uh, uh, building. So that's how we got away with that or that's how we convinced them that it was a bad idea to add insulation and drywall on there. Uh, the bear says thank you for uh, making buildings more energy efficient and keeping them around longer. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thanks.